All right, so this is the last class of the cryptography course. I'm going to talk about TLS and then briefly describe the Lightning Network project. And that's it. Next week, the final exam is available. And that's it for this course. So let's look at TLS, which is probably the most important uh, piece of cryptography. It's the one people use every day on the Internet. And it involves combining all the others together. So we'll talk about the protocol suite and 1.3, the latest version, why it's better. So the point of TLS is to protect communications at layer 4. Layer 4 of the OSI model is the transport layer. This is where you have TCP and UDP. And it contains all the internet traffic you might have. And um, also machine-to-machine -machine communications for internet of things. So it uh, defines a session. Now the problem is... It was originally uh, SSL invented by Netscape to provide some kind of encryption for the web, but it got very big, and it can't have too many features, and they were too insecure, so there was just a long series of attacks. Heartble Heartbleed was probably the worst, where you could just expose RAM from the server and leak out secrets, but there were many others exploiting vulnerabilities in this protocol. So TLS 1.3 is where they just had a complete overhaul of the protocol, and removed a lot of the unnecessary features and old algorithms to make it better, much more secure, simpler, and faster. So uh, the point of this is to create a confidential channel. There you, nobody can read it except the desired recipient, but it goes over an unprotected internet so other people can see it, but they can't decrypt it, and it's, so it's authenticated. You know who you're talking to, and you know that only the recipient can receive the data and that it gets there unmodified. So it has integrity control and confidentiality and authentication. And so it has to handle man-in-the-middle attacks because when you're talking over the Internet, there are a lot of people in the middle at the router, at your ISP, and so on. There are a bunch of people that have the chance to intercept your traffic and read it or modify it, and you have to be prepared for that and prevent it from working and TLS does that because of certificate authorities. You have trusted third parties which prove they vouch for the person you're trying to talk to, the machine, the server you're trying to talk to, and tell you it is really, in fact, the authentic server. So here's some requirements. It's got to be not wasting too much CPU time. It's got to work on any kind of hardware. It should be extensible, and it should be versatile. These are the basic requirements for something so important as an Internet encryption protocol. So here's the protocol suite. It's not in the transport layer. It's above layer 4. Here's the uh, seven-layer OSI model. It's above layer 4. Um, if you have any people argue where to put it, you might put it in the session layer. The difference between these three layers is very vague and arbitrary. These four have very clear meaning. You can see them in Wireshark. You can, you can see them in hardware devices. But all these three layers above kind of merge into one in practice. Anyway, so you can run it over TCP or UDP. The UDP version is called DTLS for Datagram Transport Layer Security because UDP packets are datagrams, or UDP segments are datagrams. So, 95, Netscape began with SSL to guide some encryption for the Internet. Before that, everything was sent essentially in plain text, which was pretty awful. So they brought it SSL. Both of the SSL2 and SSL3 were used for years, but they eventually were found to have security flaws, and they're all totally deprecated, and nobody should use them for any purpose anymore. TLS is the replacement, and each version is more secure. A lot of people used 1.0 and 1.1 until Snowden leaked out the information that the NSA was targeting American Internet companies as if they were foreign adversaries, hacking into them and stealing all their stuff. And that greatly increased people's interest in forward security, so pretty much everybody jumped to TLS 1.2 because of Snowden. Um, otherwise, they probably would have taken a lot longer to make the change. So this one was complex, but it's, and it, he also supported AES CBC, which we've used. That's the one you used in the uh, um, padding or Oracle attack. Um, and it had, but anyway, TLS 1.2 does have some forward secrecy, which we'll talk about more later. Is, yeah. Is What's that? No, SSL, SSL can be used. You can have a server that speaks SSL, and you can have a client that speaks SSL, and there probably are. But there's uh, OpenSSL. Yeah, there is OpenSSL. That's you, but all that does is, yeah, there's, the software exists to run it, although I think OpenSSL will now actually produce TLS in a modern version. But I'm not sure. But I mean, you certainly can run the software. We are still updating uh, OpenSSL. Well, yeah, but I don't think OpenSSL is actually providing SSL. Let me take a look. That's a very good question. OpenSSL, um, OpenSSL software, but I 
don't think it's actually giving you, I think it, 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 what you use it, you now get TLS. Um, but people are still updating Open SSL 3.1, yeah, but I don't think it's talking the SSL protocol. Um, but people are still using it, updating it. It's yeah, the fact that it's called Open SSL, use, there, does Open SSL support TLS 1.3, for example? And it does. So they call it Open SSL as a legacy name, but it's really the software used for TLS. So it may be possible to still produce SSL with Open SSL, but nobody does that anymore. The only the only people that would still use that would be really old servers, and really old clients. But the, but the software is still updating. It. Sure, the software is updating, and the software is not producing TLS. It's still called SSL. A lot of people continue to call it SSL, even though technically now it's TLS. It's just like a slang term. So I mean, this software, even though it's called Open SSL, it's in fact providing TLS connections. It, it, this is very common, by the way. It's part of why naming is so confusing on the internet. A lot of things have names that are there for historical reasons. The name refers to something that used to happen that doesn't happen anymore. Anyway, so, all right. So TLS, you got a record protocol to encapsulate your data. Oh, and I see someone here. For OpenSSL, LibreSSL is now more popular. Mac OS is using LibreSSL. Yeah, there's also LibreSSL. Yeah, anyway, so, um, and, and I think the difference is one of them actually went through a serious security audit after Heartbleed in 2014. And I think that might be LibreSSL, the one that's actually been through a serious security audit because people were horrified to discover such a serious insecurity in OpenSSL. Not the, not the normal code. It's like people hacking to uh, OpenSSL. That's right. 2014, it was a very serious vulnerability, so but it was not a vulnerability in that. Well, I don't know about I don't know about that. There may be some other new problem with OpenSSL. That's true. Let me take a look. Is there a new security problem? Let's try news. Uh, I didn't hear about a new OpenSSL vulnerability, but there are tons of them. Uh, here's the official vulnerabilities. And uh, 2022. November, a buffer overrun can be triggered in a certificate validation. Oh, high severity. Oh, well, that's interesting. Okay. It's very really recent. Yeah, very recent. This month. Yeah. No, last month. No, that's good. Yep. yep. So it still happens. Like every software, there are vulnerabilities. All right. Good. Anyway. And then there's the handshake protocol, which is how it agrees on the key to use. So here's what it looks like. You have syn synac act to open the TCP socket so you can send data. Then your client sends a client hello, telling it what cryptographic protocols the client supports. The server looks at that and picks one, and then sends a server hello, including a certificate. And so that goes here. Now the client has a certificate, so it has a public key of the server, and it knows what protocol you're using, so it encrypts something and sends it up here, and now from this, you're going to have a, um, diff, this includes a Diffie-Hellman handshake, so they end up with a, uh, a shared secret, and now they can use AES. So the client hello those lists the ciphers the client can speak, and the server chooses among them. So the client hello looks like this. It has a client hello, and here it has a list of all these protocols, AES, which Galois, Galois counter mode, and here's elliptic curve uh, DSA, um, and there's, down here is older ones, AES, CBC, old stuff, you know, anyway. And this must be TLS 1.2 to have, no, it's 1.3, huh? But it still has these old <laughs> triple deaths and CBC. Ah, that's, that kind of violates what I thought. Oh, because this is a 1.2. Okay. Um, uh, Wireshark calls this a 1.3 record layer, but in fact, this handshake client is referring to TLS 1.2, and that's why it has these old dangerous things like AES CBC included in it. Okay, so then the server has a hello. The server picks one of them and says, okay, we're gonna use this one, TLS, SHA-20, SHA Poly-1305, SHA-256. It's choosing modern protocols, which is typically what it should do. It should choose the most secure of the available options that the client can support. And there, so that's what happens. And then, uh, so now you're gonna generate a key pair and send, um, and the server will generate a key pair and they'll trade the public keys and compute a different Hellman secret at both ends. And then they'll have a AES key to um, use to send data both ways. And 
the um, client will also verify the certificate by looking at the trusted certificate authorities that's built in the browser. It only trusts a certain list of about 100 certificate authorities, and the, the certificate it gets from the server must be signed by someone and signed by another, and the end of that chain has to be a trusted certificate authority or it won't approve it. That's why it's resistant to man-in-the-middle attacks. A man-in-the-middle could do all of this and send you false cryptographic information, but when they sent you a certificate, it would not pass this test to verify the certificate. So that's the idea. That's how it works. So this, that's the certificates here verified by a certificate authority, in fact, purchased from that certificate authority. And uh, the certificate authorities have public keys hard-coded into the browser, so um, you cannot fool your browser with a website unless you somehow compromise those certificate authorities or unless you somehow overcome, take over the operating system and modify how functions operate and such, like we've talked about in the hacking mobile devices class. So the certificate tells you the name of the company. This is a Cloudflare, so it has to be on a website with that domain name. If it's on, got some other domain name on the website, then it will not be treated as valid. It's signed by DigiSearch, and it has some fingerprints and a serial number. It also has an encryption key in there. And here's the chain. This is signed by DigiSearch validation server, and here's the high assurance root CA, and this uh, key should be hard-coded into the browser. So the browser will know it's talking to the real one here by basically certificate pinning, and then it will decide whether the certificate it got claiming to be Cloudflare is really the Cloudflare certificate. So you have a record, which has got uh, just a layout for the data. You can put up to 16 kilobytes in a, a chunk of data, and the details aren't all that important. Um, you have a payload in here and a couple of preamble bits. And uh, you add zeros to the plain text if the message is short. This is so that you, uh, one of the attacks, I think the crime attack, one of them worked on looking at the length of the encrypted packets. And the, for short data, the encrypted packets are shorter, so you can take the pattern of length and deduce what page people are loading. So to prevent that, then now use zero padding to make sure that short messages are padded out to a fixed length. So it's uh, prevents you from analyzing the traffic by the size of the packet. And so you use authenticated encryption, a key derivation function, because you've got a Diffie-Hellman operation to agree on a shared secret, and then you have a key derivation function to derive a key from it. For client hello, is the client public key ephemeral? Yes, it is. This is a very good question. The server has a long-lasting key. The key has a lifetime. You get a certificate, and it's just a lot of lifetime, like two years or something. And for all that time, it's going to use exactly the same public key. And it uses the same public key for every client. But the client creates a new public private key pair at the start of every session and then throws it away. It's ephemeral. But unfortunately, it's only used to um, uh, derive the AES key that's used after that point. Is Using Diffie-Hellman, Diffie-Hellman is not able to beat a man-in-the-middle attack. Um, Diffie-Hellman, you can fool it. Right, let me bring that up. That was in a previous lecture. I think one back. Let me bring that up because that's important. Um, let me find... This is 141, Chapter 12. Recents. I don't know about this recents thing. Let's go where it is. All right. I think this was Diffie-Hellman. Nope, that's elliptic. That must be 11. Which somehow I do not have. How rude. Uh, let, well, I'm going to download it because I'm not in a hurry here, and this is worth seeing. Let me get these. I don't know how I... Oh, I know why. I came here and they locked me out, so I had to do this one from home, probably. Anyway. Um, all right. So let's look at the man in the middle with Diffie-Hellman. This is important. Okay, so here's how Diffie-Hellman works. You generate a secret A and take a public key A and send it over to Bob. Bob makes a secret B and makes a public key and sends it to Alice. Now they can both calculate this shared secret, G to the AB. But if you do a man in the middle, there we go, just the man in the middle. Now this is an eavesdropper, but the man in the middle, I don't have a slide showing them. Yeah, here's the man, yep, here's the man in the middle. Uh, no, not yet. I may not have a picture showing exactly how it works, but this will do. All right. Um, let's just get back to one of them. All right, let's go back to the one that shows the stuff there. There. So here, this person in the middle could just generate a separate key and then send that over here. 
and then Alice would encrypt with a key she'd agreed on with the evil person, and the man in the middle would also separately negotiate with this. This is not secure against a man in the middle attack. You end up with a secure encrypted session here and a secure encrypted session here, and both of these people will think they're talking securely and not be aware of the fact that they're using different keys. So you, the only way to prevent a man-in-the-middle attack is to have a trusted third party, either in time or space. Now, you can do it in time, where what you do is you implant a shared secret in both ends previously. So you have a trusted communication system in the past where they both have a secret that they add, and you can find that. That works. Or you can do it uh, without prior preparation if you have a trusted certificate authority that will validate that you're really talking to this person and not to the man in the middle. So it's very important. Um, TLS is resistant to man in the middle, but Diffie-Hellman alone is not. You have to add something extra to it, and what you have to add is the certificate authorities. All right. So uh, there. So then we got uh, zero padding. All right. So here's you got authenticated encryption to encrypt stuff. You got a key derivation function, and you have a Diffie-Hellman operation to agree on a secret without sending that secret directly over the network. So it's only got three algorithms, AES, Galois counter mode, uh, one of the counter modes, another counter mode here, and ChaSha20 stream cipher. That's it. These are the only three uh, authenticated ciphers, and it can be 128 or 256 bits. It does not allow shorter keys, so there are no insecure choices. These are all strong, modern, and secure. Um, the key derivation function is based on HMAC, and it uses SHA-256 or SHA-384, which is good. Um, and the Diffie-Hellman, you can do it with elliptic curves, or you can do it with prime numbers, RSA, the way we've done before. If you do it with RSA, you have to have at least 20, 48 bits, although that's not really recommended anymore. This is the weakest spot in TLS 1.3, is if you do 20, 48-bit RSA, that's only about 100 bits of security, which is not considered very good. You're a lot better off to use elliptic curve. That's what almost everybody uses. And you can use the NIST curves, of course, in case you are a government agency or the military and you want to use the official approved stuff, but other people prefer to use these unapproved ones like 25519 that we talked about last time. So you have many fewer cryptographic protocols supported, but they've removed all the old ones that are bad and left you with only new ones that are considered much better. So here's the improvements. They removed all these dangerous old algorithms, MD5, SHA-1, RC4, AES, CBC, MAC then encrypt. All these are ones we talked about in previous classes having various flaws. And uh, they, they've all been removed. Uh, they removed data compression. It used to compress the packets to make them smaller, and that enabled the crime attack because the length of the compressed message would leak information. So they cook out the compression. So now it is not going to try to save a little bit of bandwidth. It's going to leave the packets big in order to improve the security. Um, all right. Uh, now there's new things they've added. Downgrade protection, a single round trip handshake, and session resumption. These are new features. So downgrade attack. Suppose you have a person in the middle that tries to downgrade this way. So he says he wants TLS 1.3. The man in the middle says, no, changes the server hello message, which is the client hello message is not encrypted. So they can be intercepted and modified. So it changes the client hello saying, send her TLS 1.1. So the server will send a server hello for TLS 1.1. Uh, this would be one way to do it. You could do a downgrade attack to move them to an older insecure protocol in principle. To prevent that, there's protection now. Now there's eight bytes in the server hello that denote the TLS version, and they're cryptographically signed. So the client can verify that they really got the right version of TLS, that they really got 1.3 and they didn't get any other version. All right. Uh, then there's a single round trip handshake. Um, in TLS 1.2, you send some data and wait for response. You send more data and wait for response. TLS combines it all into one round trip just to make negotiation faster. So that's just an efficiency procedure. And then there's session resumption. Once you have already got a pre-shared key because you've already made a connection, you can make a new section by continuing to use the same key. This is just a convenience feature to make and make it faster. So when your client, you generate a key pair, the server generates a key pair, you trade those to go through in your key derivation function, your Diffie-Hellman operation. Then you uh, can use that key with your AES to send data. And um, here's the session redemption handcake. You can, you can quickly, um, I'm not quite sure about the details, but the point is you can resume and continue using the same key. You don't have to go through the client hello and server hello again. 
All right, and so here's the strengths of this. The 1.3 handshake authenticates the server with certificate and CA. The client is typically not authenticated. You can do that, but almost nobody ever does because typically your client is a browser or a phone or something and you don't have a certificate or anything. In principle, you could send a cookie or a certificate or a username and password, but I don't know any applications that do that. And it has forward secrecy, like I said. If, if I get complete control of the endpoint, like I steal your phone and it's unlocked and I copy all the memory on your phone, then I will find all the keys and secrets for the current session. So I can totally decrypt the current session and any old sessions that are still stored in RAM. This is a problem with forward secrecy. So by the way, there's a solution for this one that's been known for a long time. Your old data in RAM wouldn't still be there if you used the secure string class, which is a Microsoft class that's been available since 2005. A place you put confidential things, so they'll be removed when they're no longer needed. But a bunch of developers just don't use it, so secrets linger in RAM. But anyway, um, the thing about this is when you make a new connection to the server, you'll end up with a new key. So the um, that's called forward secrecy. So if you make, uh, even if you steal all the data from the current session, if a person makes a new session tomorrow, you will not be able to get in because there's a new key created. So uh, that's called forward secrecy, and it's a property of TLS 1.3 and I think also TLS 1.2. And that's what people did after the Snowden leak because now it is very clear the United States is archiving Internet data like crazy in Utah, saving it all, hoping to get the keys later when they can hack into a server or impound a server. They get the key, then they can go back and decrypt all that stored data. And that'll work for TLS 1.1 and earlier, but it won't work for TLS 1.2 and later. So if they actually do compromise the certificate authority and then they get the private keys from the certificate authority, then you're in deep trouble. And by the way, this just happened a couple of weeks ago to Android. The Android code signing key to, store, to sign system apps on Android phones has been being used to sign malware. So it has been compromised, and that's a big problem. But anyway, that can happen, and it happened in 2011. They made fake certificates for Google by compromising DigiNotar, a trusted certificate authority. And uh, if you do this, you typically get put out of business. Um, what happens is the people that make browsers will just decide to stop trusting you and take you out of the trusted list, and then your business is over. And that happens every now and then. Now, here's another one that came out in 2010 or so. These, this leaked out. There are law enforcement devices to intercept man in the middle, man in the middle HTTPS things. You can just buy them. They've been around for a long time. And that doesn't seem to make any sense. How could you do that? Well, the answer is there's an open secret that leaked out starting around 2012 that the trusted certificate authorities do, in fact, sell root certificates to people so they can man in the middle stuff. They sell it to corporations and to law enforcement agencies, and they've been keeping secret about it. But it leaked out. So their whole business model relies on being trusted, but they do let some people have valid certificates to perform man in the middle operations. So that's a thing. And she, Mozilla considered revoking trust in Trustwave, but I think they didn't because what Trustwave said is we are announcing that we have stopped selling root certificates. And they said, we're gonna, you were selling root certificates, we're gonna throw you out. They said, no, you're not listening. Everybody else is still selling them. We're the first company that is not gonna sell them. <laughs> And so I don't, don't think there's ever much more resolution to that, but it does show that the trusting of certificate authorities is a lot shakier than you might want it to be. Go, go, inter internet, issued a fake SSL certificate when you connect, there are people pointing that out. And uh, back, there was a time in 2008 when uh, um, RSA was a certificate authority, and they were using a really old protocol with an MD5 signed certificate. They hadn't even updated to SHA-1, and so some hackers at DEF CON actually managed to forge that MD5 certificate and make a rogue certificate authority certificate that was accepted by because they used MD5, so it was the sort of embarrassment that forced them to upgrade their stuff to at least SHA-1. All right, then of course, if you compromise the client, you can read everything, and you can also install a rogue certificate authority in the browser, in the client, to tell it to trust another man in the middle, like we did with uh, BERT in the Hacking Mobile Devices class. So that can certainly happen. And there's Heartbleed, which I mentioned. The way Heartbleed worked is you could keep a session alive. It's called the Heartbeat Protocol. You would send it something like a word bananas, and it would just echo that word back to you. So that was harmless. That was just a way to make this, the session stay alive. But the problem is, they had a place to put in data and had a length parameter, and it was not validated. So I could say, send me the 200-letter word bananas. 
And then it would write bananas into the RAM of the server, but it would not fill the rest of this. And when it sent you back 200 bytes, it would send you leftover remnant data in that area. So you could just put in largest value here, which is 65,536, and something small here, and you would get about 64 kilobytes of random memory from the server. And sometimes that included other people's sessions, other people's passwords, the server's root key, and stuff like that. So you could just dump memory from the server with this. And that turned out to be a really fatal flaw. And it was all the servers using open source software were vulnerable for two years before anybody noticed. And so it was a really big embarrassment. And it greatly changed everyone's attitude about how secure Linux was. Because if you were using Apple or Microsoft products, this would not have happened to you. It only happened to you if you used the open source uh, Linux software to make your HTTPS, which people thought was the most secure. And it turned out not to be. So there's an SSL labs test you can run to see if any certificate has any known vulnerabilities. Mac, let me just show you that. I don't think I've shown you that one. SSL labs. I, this one's pretty interesting. Here's, SS, here's SSL labs server test. So if you go to, say, uh, ccsf.edu, it'll run testing TLS of various kinds and uh, might take a minute or two to run. But it'll tell you, and it's kind of yeah, it's interesting. Here it finds the certificate. So there's the certificate, and now it's only 14% complete. I'll come back to it. It tests all these attacks and tells you which one that certificate's vulnerable to. So most basically what you get is just telling you how out of date your certificate is. If, and most of these vulner unknown vulnerabilities are not there if you update to the latest version of the certificate on your server. Anyway, and there's Let's Encrypt is the company that will give you free TLS certificates. They used to cost a lot of money. And there's other security features like HSTS. This is something that the um, IETF made, a made this as a standard, and they pushed it for several years, where you would have a security policy which allowed your server to declare that you should only interact using secure HTTPS connections and never connect by HTTP. However, um, yeah, that, this is still recommended and still used. The next one, however, public key pinning, was also recommended, and now it has become unrecommended. The problem is, if you pin a public key by, say, the, the public key from your certificate, then your certificate expires and you change it, and how do you update this? Now your clients can't connect because you got a new certificate. And your certificate might get compromised, and you might need to change it at any time. So weaker versions of this, where all you do is specify the name of the company you got your key from, would be better. And there is a new, this was deprecated now by the Google Chrome team. It turns out to be more likely to mess up the functionality of your client than to save you from an attack. So what they recommend is this thing called expect CT instead. And I don't really know exactly how it works, but it's the new replacement uh, recommended. In fact, it might be worth looking that up. Oh, here we are. We have an A on ours. Good. It tried a whole bunch of... So if you, yep. So if you find an old website, you'll probably sit C's, sometimes even F's. Some colleges have F's. And you, it's interesting to see all the tests they, they fail. Let's see if I can find out what, more about expect CT. What I've got here is expect CT. Um, certificate transparency. Um, whether it should enforce the policy. All right, well, I'm not going to understand it in a minute. It is the new recommended content. I don't know how it works. I'm just put a link there if anybody wants to check it out. But I have to get enough of this. Let's look at a Kahoot. Which is this one. What is this garbage? Okay. Classic mode.
I'll wait till the end of the song. Three, that's the way it is. Oh. All right, so what version of SSL should be used? Yep, none of them. All versions of SSL are now obsolete. All right, which message lists many ciphers? That's right, the client hello, not the server. The client is the one that determines it because they're more likely to be old and weak. All right, what feature mitigates traffic analysis? Zero padding, so every packet is the same size. All right, what's the shortest secret key in TLS 1.3? The only sizes allowed are 128 and 256. That's all you need. All right. And which of these is no longer recommended? Public key pinning. All right, good. So... Those names and we'll start recording.